I'm a real estate developer. And if you follow public opinion polls, real estate developers are ranked just slightly higher than Congress in terms of how people view us. <laughs> So based upon this apparent low regard, the university has taken a great risk in inviting me here today. <laughs> but I'm very honored and humbled to be here. Uh, before I go on, I do want to take a moment to thank all of the people who have prepared and served us our lunch today. And so I'd like to take a moment and give them a round of applause, if that's OK. <clears throat> Uh, I'm the founder, as Professor Nantel said, of the Dorn Companies, and we're now one of the largest real estate uh, development companies in the state. We provide development, architectural, construction, property management, and leasing services. We do over $500 million a year in business, and we have over 300 employees, and our headquarters are based in Bloomington, and we have a second office in uh, Denver, Colorado. So what is a real estate developer? I get, actually get asked that question a lot. Uh, including recently by multiple groups of eighth grade algebra students in a story I want to share with you. Uh, a few months back, I received an email from an eighth grade algebra teacher at Olson Middle School in North Minneapolis that I did not know. This teacher was inquiring if I would be willing to come and teach her students uh, which was five different classes, mind you, uh, about how algebra was used in the real estate development business and how, also to just talk to them about what did a real estate developer do. I really liked the idea that the teacher would reach out. I thought that took a lot of courage and a lot of guts. And I liked the idea that they were trying to create a real world connection between how eighth grade algebra connects to the real world. However, my other immediate reaction was, I didn't even know if we used algebra in the real estate development business. <laughs> So I started asking around the office, and then I found out that we actually did. I mean, I talked, to our, I talked to our architects, and they said they used it all the time, and I talked to our engineers, and they said they did as well. I went to our CFO and asked if we used it, and he said, well, it's probably in some of these computer programs we use, uh, but he didn't know for sure. Uh, but then he reminded me that his wife was a middle school math teacher in Minnetonka, and that she could help us out. Uh, and so with all of that, I thought we had this thing wired, okay? We were gonna do this, I was gonna do it. I called the teacher back and said, I'm, I'm in. And so as the day drew closer, I uh, was getting ready. I had all this information I had compiled. I had all these algebraic formulas, which I knew no, I had no idea how to use. Uh, and I had all these, I had a project pro forma, and I had plans and code requirements. I had just lots of other stuff. And I was trying to figure out how to connect it all to algebra. And so I went to the school that day, and my first 50-minute class started at 9.30. I had about 20 kids in the class. And after the teacher organized, she turned it over to me. And I started eagerly talking to them, giving my presentation. It took me about five, 10 minutes to realize that they had completely lost that group. They had no interest in what I was about to talk to them about. And uh, they didn't really care how algebra connected to the real world as an eighth grader. Now, if you've ever been around a bunch of eighth graders, which I hadn't been recently, it's a whole different world out there, okay? Uh, so, so I stopped for a moment to see if anybody had any questions. One kid asked me, how much money does a real estate developer make? <clears throat> Another asked me what kind of car I drove. A third wanted to know my net worth. And, uh, so I decided I'd ask them a question, and I asked them, did any of them know what a real estate developer does? And there were a lot of blank faces, not unlike some of the faces I'm seeing here. Uh, so I decided to put an example they might understand. I asked them how many of them played a musical instrument in the band. About a half a dozen hands went up. I asked them what they played. They said, oh, trombone, trumpet, piano, drums, etc." I asked who leads the band. They told me the band director does. I said, well, a real estate developer is a lot like being a band director. The band leader works to get all of the instrument players playing the music correctly at the same time. The band director does not need to know how to play the trombone or the drums, but the band director needs to know when they should be played. And that's very similar to what a real estate developer does. Uh, a developer brings together all these different players, such as the architects, structural and civil engineers, landscape designers, interior designers, bankers, lawyers, we have to have bankers, Richard, uh, and uh, 
maybe some investors, depending on their capital structure, and through that developer's vision, market information, leadership and communication, a building gets designed. Then the developer must uh, get the government, such as the planning commission, city council, neighbors, to understand and agree what a developer is proposing. Some might call this, more, more, this last step more about salesmanship or manipulation, but manipulation seems like a strong word. So then I looked at him and said, how do I connect this all back to algebra? And I said, all right, they all had, every kid has a cell phone. Get your cell phones out. I'd like you all to get your cell phones out because we're going to play a little game. <clears throat> Maybe you don't need your cell phone, but if it's there, you can use it, okay? And so I asked them uh, to play this game that's based on algebra. And I asked them all to pick a number between 1 and 10. Now, don't tell me what it is. Keep it to yourself. Put it in your calculator or on, the, on your cell phone. And then, Professor Nantel, you pick a number between 1 and 10 and tell me, and tell me what it is. How long do I have? However long you need. Seven. Okay, he picks seven. So I want you to take the number you have and multiply it by seven. Pick another number between 1 and 20, Professor Nantel. Should I tell you? Yep. 15. Add 15 to it. Pick another number between 1 and 20, Professor Nantel. See how good these finance guys are? All right. Five. Okay, add five to it, okay? So now I want you to subtract six. My kids are looking at me, they've played this game before. Uh, so now I want you to divide that number that you have by seven. That was the number you gave me to multiply, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Now I want you to subtract your original number. Now, everybody in this room, if you did it correctly, has the same number, and it's number two. Anybody want to admit they don't have it? Okay. Well, you're, you didn't do it right. Okay. You're going to stay after, okay? <laughs> and we're going to go through that until you get it right, okay? But that's, in essence, what a developer does. Uh, if you all have that same number, it's because I got you there. I asked you to get you there. I gave you facts that made it made sense, and, I, and you accepted the number because I, you got where I wanted you to be. And that is what a real estate developer, in essence, does. He has to take all these different forces and get them together and try to make it happen. Uh, so it's really not manipulation. It really is just algebra. Those kids love that idea. We had to do that five or six times an hour every day. I, we did it. I had them up at the board finally doing it to themselves, and they thought that was a lot of fun. So now that you know what a real estate developer does, I want to talk a little bit about where this developer came from and what impact the University of Minnesota has had on my life. A little history of me. My parents uh, were high school sweethearts. They grew up in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, they uh, married uh, in uh, the 40s and in 1948 my dad was attending the University of Minnesota studying pharmacy. He actually played a little football for uh, Bernie Berman who was the coach at the time. My oldest sister Janice was born here on campus. Uh, over the next nine years my parents had my two other sisters and finally me in 1957 so that makes me 62. By that time we lived in Duluth and my dad owned the medical arts pharmacy in downtown Duluth which is still there today. In the early 60s, unfortunately, my dad decided to run away with one of his employees, and that caused my parents to divorce. My now single mom, without the benefit of a college education, raised my three sisters and I. We did not have a lot of things, but we had a lot that mattered. Uh, my mom was a wonderful example of perseverance and tenacity. She raised us by working at times multiple jobs while also seeking training in order to get a better job. She taught us many things, but most importantly, she taught us about the value of getting an education. In fact, she insisted on it. Because of my parents' divorce, I started kindergarten. There was no daycare at the time. I started kindergarten when I was four because my mom had to go to work. I went to Minneapolis Public Schools and I graduated from Southwest High School. My mom could be tough at times, as I remembered when I was 16. I got my driver's license. I had worked part-time jobs, cut people's grass, shoveled snow, and saved up enough money to buy a $300 car and to pay for car insurance. Uh, my new chariot 
was a 1966 Ford Galaxy 500 four-door, rusted out, plastic seats and an AM radio, but it was mine. And, but I remember my mom sitting me down that day and she said the following to me. She said, uh, Kelly, I don't have a lot of money. So if you screw up and get in trouble with this car, I will have only one choice, and that will be to kill you. <clears throat> well, there was still, there still, there was then, and there still is today, a part of me that thinks that she was partially serious. <laughs> well, that first night with my car, and I was waiting to pick up my girlfriend at the time, who worked at Vestios in downtown Dinkytown, and I got hit while I was parked there. Not too much damage, but I was paid $300 by the insurance company to fix my car. So this car was free at that point. It wasn't too bad of a deal. A couple of weeks later, the transmission went out. I had no reverse. Didn't have any money left. Had no way of fixing the car. So I drove all winter long with no reverse. Silver lining on that was I had to go to school early so I could park on the street in front of a driveway so I could pull out without having to back up. Driving that car took a lot of pre-planning. <laughs> I think that helped me later in life. I ended up buying a used transmission, knew nothing about fixing a car, and a buddy and I put it in the, put it in the car in my mom's garage. We got transmission, flew it all over the floor. She was not a happy camper. When I graduated from high school, I applied only to one college, and that was the University of Minnesota. It was the only place I could afford to go. I was happy to be accepted. And I worked part-time jobs and had a few student loans in order to get through it. I lived at home because I could not live, I could not afford to live on campus. It's a bit ironic that I would later come to develop nearly $200 million worth of student housing on a campus that I couldn't afford to live in. My mom, who was 50 at the time, and I kind of became like roommates. I worked part-time as a delivery boy for a liquor store located at the corner of Franklin and Nicollet while I attended school. I remember one Saturday night, I, she's going to hate me for saying this story. Uh, for, I remember one Saturday night, I had to work until about 10, came home after work with a pizza. I ate about half of it and I put the rest in the refrigerator. My mom came home about an hour later and was pretty clear she'd been out having something to drink. I heard her rummaging around the refrigerator and she then said goodnight and we headed to her room. We lived in a small house on 5900 block of Newton Avenue out by uh, Penn and Crosstown. Little, post-World War II, two-bedroom expansion home, so many of them in Minneapolis. As I was heading to bed, I noticed the light from her room was coming out of the door. I knocked and got no response. I opened the door to just check on her to make sure she was okay. She was sound asleep, with a side of her face laying in that pizza. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Um, I, of course, had to tell a few friends, and we all got a good laugh out of it, until one day a close friend who knew my mother really well and in jest called her pizza face. Let's just say we all ran out of the house for our own safety. I owe a lot to my mom. She taught me many things and I miss her every day. Not living on campus that made the University of Minnesota seem so large. I remember walking from class to class. I remember falling in love so many times while passing somebody by only to never see them again. The U was a special place. It was a special environment, but I made it through. It took me five years to graduate with my bachelor's degree because I had to pay my own way through. It was early 1981. Ronald Reagan was our new president. The economy was not good and jobs were hard to get. I decided to go back to school and get an MBA from the business school. It wasn't called the Carlson School at the time. I got accepted to an accelerator program they had at the time and I was able to complete my MBA with a concentration in finance in one calendar year. And near the end of this time, we were all in interviewing with companies who came on campus. Many of my classmates with finance concentrations were interviewing and taking jobs with the finance departments and companies like General Mills and Pillsbury and 3M. While I appreciated these great companies, that type of job really sounded boring to me. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. That's when I really met Professor Nantel. He was teaching financing. I did not have him as a professor, but I was, I, I was, uh, I came across, we came across each other one day and I knew who he was. I'm sure he didn't know who I was. And for whatever reason, I asked his thoughts on career paths and opportunities. 
Like any good professor, he started to ask me questions. He spent a fair amount of time with me, not knowing me. I'm sure he doesn't remember this. We talked for a while. <clears throat> and at the end of the conversation, he suggested that I look at going to banking. Not necessarily as a career path, but as a place to start and learn. He said that if I went that path, I'd learn a lot about a number of different businesses and I'd interact with high-level people in those businesses. I ended up back at the placement office and I saw the Bank of America was coming to campus to interview interested candidates, so I signed up to get an interview. Well, they offered me a job to go work in their business banking department, business banking department in San Diego. I thought that was okay, and I accepted it. But prior to graduating, I got a call from the placement office asking if I'd be willing to interview with a real estate development company called Trammell Crow. I was about one of six candidates they asked to interview. We didn't even know what Trammell Crow was. I mean, we didn't have the internet, we didn't Google anything, we had to go to the library and figure it out. We laughed at the name. Uh, we were wondering what this was all about. And all six of us had already accepted jobs, but even though we, didn't, we had accepted those jobs, we went and interviewed anyway. <clears throat> How could you turn on an interview for a company called Trammell Crow? I didn't get the job, but a good friend of mine named Stu Stender did. Stu's been a very successful real estate uh, player in this town for many years. Um, I graduated, went to San Diego. I learned a lot about the banking business. I, learned, I, I ended up in a workout department. I helped with a number of mainly entrepreneur, entrepreneurial businesses that were in financial trouble. I also learned that many of those business owners had expensive personal toys like airplanes and yachts, and they were costly to own and operate, and yet they wouldn't give them up despite the financial condition of their businesses. So I really learned not to buy a yacht or an airplane. <laughs> well, at the bank, I, was, I had probably the most impactful thing happen to me in my professional life. After arriving in the bank, the bank started to encounter financial difficulties. They needed to cut costs, and they, they should have probably done that with layoffs. But they had, the bank had had a long history and proud history of never having had a layoff in its, in its uh, nearly 100 years of existence. So instead of doing a layoff, they started to pick, in people, pick on people in hopes that they would quit. The focus of this was mainly directed at middle management level, who were mainly middle-aged men, many of whom had been with the bank their whole careers. They would change their job title, transfer them to another location that added to a long Southern California commute. They took away long established perks and basically did everything possible to entice them to quit. And many of them did. But I saw the anguish and the anxiety that this created in these people. And I made myself a promise that when I was in my middle-aged years, that I was not going to allow myself to be in a position that's where someone could impact me in that way. I was going to control my own destiny, and I was going to start to set a course to do that that day. But without Professor Nantel's advice, I would never have been there. I would never have experienced that. Maybe I'd still be a banker someplace. I don't know. But after a couple of years in San Diego, the bank offered me a transfer back to Minneapolis. They had an office here, and I came back here. Now back in Minneapolis, I'd get together with my graduate school friends, including Stu Stender. We'd talk about our jobs over beers or cocktails. The real estate industry sounded so fascinating to me. His job sounded so interesting to me. And Stu was very helpful and instrumental, actually, in getting me involved in the real estate business and switching from banking. And we became friendly competitors. I went to work for another Texas-based developer called the Vantage Companies. But him getting his job from Channel Crow because of the University of Minnesota led me into real estate. Without that happening, my life would likely be vastly different. The greatest thing I learned while here at the University of Minnesota was learning how to learn. Life is about learning. That aspect, along with the mentoring I had and the network of people I've met because of the University of, Minnesota, has a, University of Minnesota has had a great impact on my life. I've been in the real estate business now for over 30 years. I love every minute of it. I love going to work every day. I can't wait to get there every day. I've been blessed to be associated with many wonderful people. We together have built billions of dollars of projects. We've created tens of thousands of jobs. We've contributed to our communities, we've won many awards, and we've donated to many causes. And I want to show you a couple of things, and here it is. Uh, 
I founded the Dorn Companies in 2007 after a 15-year partnership with my good friend and mentor, Robert Muir. The Dorn Companies, as I said earlier, does about 500 million in volume, has about 300 employees in its development, architectural, construction, and management groups. Prior to the Dorn Companies, I ran the Robert Muir Companies. Robert and I were partners, and we built and developed and managed about 4 million square feet of shopping centers here in the upper Midwest, mainly here in Minnesota. We built product all over town, many award-winning projects, and uh, those are some of the projects that we built, uh, from Woodbury to Minneapolis to, Oak, to, to Oakdale to uh, Blaine to, to uh, all over. Uh, we, did we did business with companies ranging from mom and pa retailers to industry leaders like Target, Walmart, Best Buy, and many others. In 2005, I decided to stop developing and for some strange reason to run for political office. <laughs> oh boy, I should have bought a red convertible instead. Um, I spent a couple million dollars of my own money running on the, on the campaign. I'd like to have the money back, but I don't regret doing it. Uh, I had a wonderful experience traveling around this great state. I met people I would never have met. I went to places I never would have gone. And it was overall just a great experience. But lucky for me, I wasn't very good at it and I eventually dropped out of the race. However, during the campaign, I had the opportunity to meet with then President of the University of Minnesota, Robert Grudnicks, which unknowingly at the time ended up shaping the entire future of my business. After the campaign, I decided to go in a different direction in the real estate industry instead of shopping centers. Robert Muir who was 30 years my senior, and unfortunately no longer with us, and I amicably split up. We split our properties up, we split our employees up, and I bought them out of our little fledging construction company. And the Dorn Companies came into being in 2007. We had a dozen or so employees, and we did about $20 million a year. So we've had a little growth. We've decided to focus our attention on building commercial space and student housing at the University of Minnesota campus. We signed a purchase agreement to buy the Dinky Dome property at the corner of 15th and University, it's still there. Our initial thought was to tear the building down. It was a wreck. Uh, it was built in the 1920s as the Minneapolis Bible College and was really now in a sorry state of affairs. We found dead rats in the walls. Uh, the building was not historically designated and we thought we were going to be able to proceed. But the city of Minneapolis, however, had other ideas and they wanted the, the Dinky Dome saved. That left us with only trying to build in the remainder of the property which was not big enough. The university had a parking lot adjacent to our property, so we tried to determine if they would sell part of the parking lot to us so we could build the building. We kept hearing from the university people that the U did not sell property. They only bought it. We offered to sell them our property. They wouldn't buy it. <laughs> but without the additional land, our project was not feasible. We were all about ready to give up when I decided to call President Brudnick to see if he would meet to discuss this project. He was very gracious and he agreed to meet. I told him about our project, which at the time was a 14-story apartment building with great amenities, and they would be renovating the Dinky Dome as well. I shared our opinion that this project would become a catalyst for more buildings of its type on the campus and that we would help the university address its serious issue of lack of quality housing around the campus, as well as the wrap of being such a commuter campus. He agreed with me and decided the university would agree to sell us the land we needed. So I told you this algebra stuff works. With that, we were able to get our project approved by the city of Minneapolis and we were ready to go in the fall of 2008. We named the building Sydney Hall after my youngest daughter. We closed on the $10 million purchase of the property in the end of August of 2008 and we, brought out and we bought out and terminated all the leases in the property, not knowing that in September, Wall Street would collapse and that our financing for the project would disappear. We now had $10 million sitting in this property generating no revenue, and there was no financing available as the real estate market came to a sudden stop. So what did we do? We drank heavily for a few months <laughs> until we figured out that wasn't gonna help. We needed to get back at it and redesign the project, cut costs and figure it out and how to get it financed. We ultimately were able to do all that, but we had to put everything, but I had to put everything I owned on the line in order to get the financing. 
We started construction in 2009 and we delivered the building in 2000, fall of 2010, ready for school. The building leased really well at rents not yet achieved in the marketplace, not just at the university, in the marketplace. We had the building about 80% leased by February. We weren't going to deliver the building until August. Of the 80% leased, about 80% of those were females. I watched them work, their fathers. Daddy, I'll be safe in this building. What father could resist that? So we figured out a new marketing ploy when we got to those numbers, and we figured out that we were going to tell everybody that we were 60% leased to, to females. Boy, the boys lined up. <laughs> we had the building fully leased by April, and we delivered the building, and it, and it opened up. Now, we were new to this, and we thought this was really a great idea. We had all these people moving in. We, had, we were a little ahead of schedule on construction. School didn't start until after Labor Day. We said, let's let the kids move in gradually. Boy, was that a mistake. We had Animal House for a month. Uh, we still have video. If you were in that group, we still have video of you doing things you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but without the assistance of President Brutnick, who I originally met while campaigning, we would not have been able to build Sydney Hall, and we likely would not have built the other buildings we built on campus. We started, as I said, Sydney Hall in 2009 during hard times. It was a catalyst for a lot of other buildings to get built around the campus. And I believe this has helped make the university campus a better place to live and assisted with the university's ability to recruit and retain some of the best and brightest students. The Great Recession hit the real estate industry very hard. We were very fortunate and that we were not as impacted as others were. And in fact, we grew every year through the recession. We kept busy and we remained profitable. We added staff while many others were shrinking and going bankrupt. A lot of that was because of our ability to continue to get finance for projects that we were building around this campus. That was only 10 years ago. Lots changed in 10 years. These are some of the projects we built around campus. Collectively, these buildings create about 600 units that housed over 1,500 students. We learned that many of the residents were okay with sharing bedrooms. And when they did so, the cost of living in a new and safe apartment building was around five to $600 per month per student. That was comparable to about the same cost to rent a room in some dilapidated house around the campus. We offered many amenities, like one bedroom per bathroom, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, heated parking, study lounges, free coffee, free internet, social rooms, exercise rooms, and one building even had a movie theater. We like to think that we were at the forefront of changing the living environment at the campus. Many others came behind us and built many more great buildings. But we believe what we helped start it. And as a U graduate myself, who could not afford to live on campus, I feel tremendous pride in that. We won a number of industry awards for these projects, and we are most proud of, but we are most proud of winning multiple times the Grapevine Award from the students at the U for having the best managed buildings. From student housing, we migrated into multifamily housing in both the urban core and the suburban markets. We built products in Minneapolis, Brooklyn Park, Hopkins, Maple Grove, there's a couple Shakopee, there's a couple other here, Zedina, there's some other names that are not on there. We also like to put into our buildings public art. We've had a lot of fun doing this. And, but probably the most unusual thing that we did, there's some of them, different pieces of art we commissioned. Probably the most unusual thing that we did was our antique tractor collection at our Moline project in downtown Hopkins. Years ago, there was a large employer in Hopkins. It was headquartered there. And then they manufactured farm tractors. It was called the Minneapolis Moline. Long history in the area. Uh, dating back into the 1800s and all the way into the 1960s when they were uh, bought by another tractor company. So one Sunday winter afternoon, uh, while the building was under construction, I thought it would be a great idea to try to find an antique tractor to put in the lobby instead of a piece of art. And uh, so I got on the internet and I started uh, Googling all these things, Moline, and realized that this antique tractor field was actually an industry unto itself. Uh, and to make a long story short, we did not end up with one Moline tractor in the lobby. We ended up spending a whole bunch of money on seven of them. 
uh, and we had to expand the lobby to accommodate all of them. And we have, a tr we have tractors that go back to the 1930s into the 1950s. And it's really quite the thing to see, and they're beautiful. And so if you're ever out in Hopkins, you want to see some antique tractors, stop by the Moline. It's free. It's open to the public. Uh, and you can go from there. We uh, decided a few years ago to diversify ourselves geographically. And our first attempt to do that was we moved to, uh, we moved, opened an office in Denver. Denver is seeing unbelievable growth, if you're not familiar with it. And I don't think it's just because pot is legal, although who knows. Uh, we currently have a number of multifamily projects under construction and development. And in the coming years, we hope to make this geographic expansion to other cities and states. Our largest project to date, we have under construction nearby at University and Central Avenues. We're building our largest project. It's called the Expo. Uh, it is a $140 million, 370 unit multifamily project. It's named after the building, which used to be in an area called the Exhibition Center. And uh, it's a 50 50 joint venture between uh, the Dorn Companies and Gary Holmes of CSM. 25 story t uh, tower, great views of the uh, river in uh, Minneapolis. And, and so if you need a place to live, let us know. Come and see us. Uh, about three years ago, I had another significant event, life event, in that I was feeling physically pretty horrible. Uh, my wife, Connie, who's here today, raise your hand, <laughs> uh, sitting next to Professor Nantel, uh, dragged me to the emergency room where they decided to do a chest x-ray to see if I had pneumonia. Uh, the x-ray came back indicating that I did have pneumonia, but it also showed something else was in my lungs. And with more tests, it was determined that I had lung cancer. Uh, now, I never smoked cigarettes. I never smoked anything. Well, I never smoke cigarettes. And uh, so this seemed bizarre to me. Uh, but it didn't matter at the end because I had it. I ended up in surgery and they removed the top lobe of my right lung. And unfortunately, the cancer had not spread. So getting pneumonia and having my wonderful wife drag me to the emergency room saved my life and today I'm cancer-free. <clears throat> How many people in this room have had or have cancer? Raise your hand. How many in this room have people that they know that have cancer? There you go. So it affects a lot of us, and it affected me. Although I was only 58 years old when I was diagnosed, I started to think not only my obligations to my family, but also the obligation I had to my work family. We had hundreds of people and their families who relied on working at the Doran companies. I began to feel a great responsibility to them. We had to start planning for the future of the Doran companies without me. We were so fortunate to have so many great people in the organization. Ann Barron, who was our general counsel, and now at the time was our chief operating officer, as well as Ryan Johnson, who was our CFO, were the glue that kept everything together. The three of us started talking about how they could become part owners of the company. The talks went on for a while, and at times they were getting frustrated with me because I think they thought I was not ready to give it up. My oldest son, Evan, who also recently joined the company and is here today. Evan, you want to raise your hand? My other son, Kramer, who was in school here, also became involved in the process. I understood their frustration, but it was for the wrong reasons. I came around to recognize that I did not want to have minority partners in my business. The fact was, I wanted to be the minority partner. And I wanted them to be the majority partner. I didn't want to run the business anymore. I wanted to focus my attention on doing what I love to do, and that is to develop, create, and build buildings. And I wanted to do other things in my life. I wanted to do, there's other things I desire to do, and I want to spend more time with my wife and family. So Ann bought 
a majority interest in the business, and Ryan and I are minority partners. So I have a favor of you. If you need construction services, please call Ann and Ryan, because they owe me a lot of money. <laughs> but there's a bit of irony here. All of my life, I've had the challenge of gender identity with my name. My wife, Connie, and I like to travel. And it's not uncommon when checking into a hotel to have a greeting card in our room that welcomes Miss Kelly and Miss Connie. But I do think it's pretty cool now that the Dorn companies will soon be the largest female-owned business in the state of Minnesota. I'm getting behind here, sorry. Ann and Ryan and I. Lastly, or one of, one of the things we do is we have these signs up there up here on all of our projects. And we're asking people to thank a construction worker. We thank a lot of people in our lives, and I want to I ask you to thank a construction worker. There are fewer and fewer of them these days. I've run into other people that are in the construction business here today, and we all make that same comment. Without them, your life, your life would be a lot different. They work hard every day in the heat, cold, rain, and snow to build our society. It is my honor to know many of them. So thank one of them when you have a chance for all they do. One last thing. Here is the algebra equation we did together. Write it down. Learn how to do it. Your kids will think you're a genius. The University of Minnesota is one of the state's great institutions. We are lucky to have it. We are lucky to be part of it. It has had many great influences in our lives. They're the ones we read about. I'm not talking football scores or basketball scores. Sorry, Randy. Uh, I'm talking about all the other things it does for our lives. It's, it's the big things that are announced. It's the, the science breakthroughs or the companies that are formed from it. But it's also the little things. It's Tim Nantel spending time with somebody he didn't know, helping them set a direction in their life. It's Robert Brudnick's spending time on a harebrained idea that he liked, that helped tra transform the face of the campus. Those are the things that the, how the University of Minnesota contributes to all of our lives, and we are lucky to be part of it, and thank you very much for having me here today. Okay. I think we're also going to take some questions if anybody has any. Yes. There are two of us with microphones in the room, so if you have questions, please raise your hand and we'll come to you. Hi, Kelly. What a dynamic speech, and thank you for being here today. I've seen a lot of your projects on campus. I know you've had the Knoll and sold it, and I saw the project on 610. My dad is a developer, and so, uh, you know, what you said is uh, brings a lot home today. I wanted to know, with Dorn companies expanding and you wanting to move to different states and markets, there's a real risk in construction because it's the first economic thing when things go south to slow down. When you move to different markets and you're in Kelly, uh, or, uh, Dorn Construction is thinking about moving to different states, what's the real, how do you start that out? Uh, from, from beginning until you decide you're going to go there and construction is going to begin and so forth? Well, I think it's a good question because it is a big risk going for different markets. The, the variables are different. The, the, the process is different. It's amazing to me the differences in construction techniques between Minneapolis and Denver uh, and the quality of workforce that we benefit from here in Minneapolis that are, is not the same elsewhere. Um, I think one of the benefits we have uh, towards that, though, is that we try to control the process. So we're on the development side, we're on the architectural side, we're on the construction side, we're on the management side. And I think because of that vertical integration, we're able to manage through that process probably better than had we just shown up to try to do other people's work. 
Does that answer your question? No. We've got one over here. Thank you for your speech. Very well done. Um, I wanted, I was just curious if you could talk more about uh, affordability of housing. It sounded like that was very near and dear to your heart based on your experience and wondered if the Doran companies were doing more uh, on that front. Well, uh, I think by anybody's measure, we have a, and you hear this in the press often, that we do have an affordable housing crisis. Um, I'm not sure of some of the programs and, and politics that are being offered are gonna solve that problem. Because if you think that we have an affordable housing crisis, what we really have is an affordable housing finance disaster. It's about the money. Uh, and having the, the typical gap now from new construction to what an affordable unit can justify from a cost standpoint is now in the neighborhood of $200,000 per unit in a gap. So somehow that gap has to be filled. Um, I don't think the private sector is gonna be able to do that on its own. And so it's gonna require all of us who think that's a problem to actually step up. And uh, which, that may mean tax increases, that may mean redirecting funds, that may mean other things in order to fill this gap or hopefully raising people's wages through education. Uh, a big part of the affordability gap is due to lack of education and or other issues of mental health and addiction. So we have a lot of those issues that need to be addressed beyond the affordable housing aspect as well. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.